Thank you all so much for being here today. I'm very excited to share some work uh, with my co-author, Laura Georges, who's here in the audience today from the London School of Economics, as well as Alexander Wagner and Jochen Menges at the University of Zurich. So as we've seen in the past years, over and over again, global crises threaten general economic stability, leading companies to suffer financially, um, jeopardizing their existence and the livelihoods that they support. So of course there was the 2008 through 2009 financial crisis that started in the US and ignited across the globe, the COVID-19 pandemic, and most recently the Russian invasion of Ukraine, all of which for instance caused a steep decline in the stock market. In fact, the stock market shock prompted by COVID-19 was a time of unprecedented financial crisis, as shown in this graph, which is the Russell 3000 index, or the 3000 largest publicly traded companies in the United States, which represents in total 98% of the US public equity market. So from the time period of February 24th through March 20th, as we can see here, there was a really steep decline in the um, stock prices of these companies in the Russell 3000 index. In fact, this decline was even steeper than the one that occurred in this index from the 2008-2009 financial crisis. So as financial crises like these emerge, we might wonder what could CEOs of these companies do to help their companies maintain value and weather these intense financial crises. So as COVID-19 unfolded, I began to look at transcripts of earnings conference calls, or calls between top executives and financial analysts who are evaluating their companies. And I looked at calls in which COVID-19 as a crisis was being discussed as this crisis unfolded from January 2020 through March 2020. And what I was struck by was how different sometimes the responses that these CEOs gave when talking about the crisis were. So for instance, here on the left, we have the CEO of Zebra, a technology company who talks about the COVID-19 crisis in a very human way. He acknowledges the human costs of the crisis. So he starts by saying, obviously, the coronavirus makes a very fluid situation. I'll start by saying our first priority is making sure that our employees, partners, and customers are safe. And this is a human story more than anything, I think. So in these very economically and financially focused calls, he's taking a moment to acknowledge the costs to human health and well-being that are part of the COVID-19 crisis. And this is something that didn't uh, happen with all CEOs. So here, just as one point of comparison, we have uh, Robert Painter, the CEO of Trimble, who's focusing mostly on just the economic costs of COVID-19 and how they might affect the company. So he says, okay, then there's the COVID-19 topic. We find ourselves in a more challenged environment here at the moment, and we believe we can still prevail through that. And we look at the long baseline record of the company, and we've sold in up markets and down markets and come out of down markets reasonably fast. So he's really trying to offset the analysts' concerns about potential economic costs of the crisis without talking about their human crisis, uh, costs as well. So we started to wonder is whether this brief acknowledgement of the human costs of the COVID-19 crisis might have any kind of tangible impact. So we wondered whether the focus that some CEOs show on human costs might pay off in some way. For instance, could these companies actually fare better on the stock market if CEOs focus on human costs as well as the potential economic costs of crisis? And the reason why we thought this might happen is that past research shows that CEOs' words in these earnings calls can actually influence analysts' evaluations of their company's worth, and that can actually translate into an immediate effect on the stock market, particularly because investors often learn a lot from analysts' evaluations about the potential value of a company. And we've seen that the language that executives use in earnings calls can actually buffer against adverse market reactions. So for instance, when companies are revealing bad news in earnings calls, but they use euphemistic language to kind of soften the blow, it actually mitigates the effect of bad news on stock market returns. And just kind of reiterating how important executives' actions in these calls are, one a lawyer for a prominent Silicon Valley firm in giving advice to top executives about how to manage these calls said, successfully handling analyst conference calls requires the nuancing abilities of a diplomat and the patience of a saint. A slip of the tongue can send a company's stock price into cardiac arrest. So there's reasons to expect that what happens in these calls could actually reverberate on the stock market. So this led us to ask three questions in our research. 
First, how frequently do CEOs actually acknowledge a crisis human costs uh, compared to economic costs in these conversations with financial analysts? How might that relate to their company's stock returns during a crisis? And ultimately, thinking about this audience of financial analysts, how might CEOs' acknowledgement of a crisis shape financial analysts' trust in CEOs and thus their evaluations of a company's value? So let's go ahead and turn to this first question. What we did to get at this question was coded transcripts of earnings conference calls that took place during COVID-19 for mentions of human costs, so any kind of costs to health and well-being versus economic costs to business operations. And we found that among the 448 CEOs of publicly traded Russell 3000 companies who spoke explicitly about COVID-19 and earnings conference calls, almost all of them talked about the potential economic costs of the crisis, almost 97%. But just over half, around 51.8%, took time to mention human costs. So this happened as the crisis was unfolding, a very dynamic situation. We might wonder, what would happen today? Perhaps the COVID-19 pandemic made the human costs of crises much more salient, and people would be more likely to recognize them, even in calls with financial analysts. What we did to look at this question is actually conducted a study a couple of weeks ago where we asked business students to imagine being a CEO or a financial analyst in an earnings conference call during a crisis. And we asked them to prepare for these calls. For the CEOs, we said, you have a limited amount of time. What are the three top issues that you would talk about if a new and highly dangerous variant of the um, COVID uh, virus emerged? For financial analysts, we asked them to list the three points that they thought would be most important for CEOs to address. And we found, even now two years and counting into the pandemic, that most of the participants uh, in this study focused on economic costs. Out of the different costs that they mentioned, about two-thirds were economic costs, around uh, just over a quarter human costs of the crisis as a point for discussion, and some other topics. Interestingly, we saw then that around a third of those who were assigned to the role of CEOs never mentioned human costs, even in the wake of the crisis compared to almost half of financial analysts who are really focused on economic costs and preparing for these uh, potential calls about the dangerous COVID-19 variant. In fact, um, over one third of financial analysts listed only economic costs as talking points. So we see this kind of disproportionate focus on acknowledging economic costs of a crisis in earnings calls, um, less of a, a concentration on the crises, human costs that are also there. So now to turn to this next question, how might a CEO acknowledgement of a crisis human cost relate to their stock returns during a crisis? To look at this question, we examined cumulative stock returns, or the aggregate amount that a company's stock price changed over a specific time period. In our case, the time of this steep decline that I showed you on that graph when stock prices were plummeting in the US. So this is the time period where the crisis really unfolded, where national lockdown restrictions were implemented in Italy, and a time when most of the companies in the US were really experiencing a stark decline in stock prices. What we found is that the number of times that a CEO acknowledged the human costs of the COVID-19 crisis predicted their cumulative uh, returns during this crisis period. And we found that this relationship held when controlling for other um, measures that are standard in the financial literature, like leverage, cash holdings, um, size based on market capitalization. And they also held when we omitted outliers based on Cook's and leverage scores. Just to give you a sense of the size of this effect, um, a one standard deviation in acknowledgement of human costs was associated with 1.99 percentage points higher cumulative returns during the crisis period. So given that the median value, a market value of equity in the sample of companies that we looked at was 3.17 billion, this effect in total amounts to around 63 million of company value that was preserved in the wake of the crisis with a uh, more acknowledgement of human costs. And notably, this is a sizable effect when you look at other measures um, that affect cumulative returns in the financial literature. For instance, leverage, a key measure of financial strength that looks at uh, debt and companies, which was also a very um, influential predictor of returns during the crisis, and we see that the effect was equivalent to around 60% of the effect of a standard deviation increase in leverage. Okay, so we wondered why might this effect be emerging? Why would we see an association between acknowledgement of a crisis, human costs, and cumulative stock returns? And this is where we thought the financial analyst might play a role, that perhaps a financial analyst responds positively when a CEO acknowledges the human cost of a crisis 
that they evaluate companies' resilience in a crisis more positively in ways that could reverberate on the market. And we started to think about this when we looked into the text of the calls from the CEOs talking about the human costs of crisis. We kind of started to probe these calls deeper to explore what could underlie this relationship. So we used dictionaries that were created in the linguistic inquiry and word count software tool, which calculates the percentage of a text that has words that fit certain categories, to explore what could possibly be going on in these calls. And what emerged was that we found that CEOs who acknowledged human costs expressed more benevolence in uh, calls. So this is expressing concerns about human welfare and that benevolence actually predicted then higher cumulative returns. And we thought this was really interesting because benevolence is a key element of trust. In foundational theories of trust, there's kind of three different factors. Benevolence, concerns about human welfare, as well as ability, of competence, and integrity, so being principled. So we wondered if perhaps what might be happening in these calls is that CEOs acknowledging the costs that the crisis has to human health and well-being might communicate benevolence to analysts, which influences their evaluations of this company's resilience in a crisis more positively in ways that could then reverberate on the stock market. So to try to get at this, what we did is created um, essentially a, a finance game where we gave a bunch of enthusiasts who we recruited over the internet from Reddit, uh, where there's different sub forums for people interested in different topics. So we looked at those who were pursuing a career in finance and we gave them a one-pager about a company based actually off of one of the companies in our sample, the Zebra Technologies uh, company. And we asked them to read some information about this company and then to predict what the company's stock price was during the height of the COVID-19 crisis. So what we did is we actually varied whether the CEO in this one-pager talked about the human cost of the crisis. Here again saying this is a human story more than anything. Some of the people who were uh, acting as financial analysts in this study saw a quote that acknowledged human costs, but some saw a quote that only acknowledged the economic costs of the crisis or economic costs with some extra text to match the length of the human and economic costs condition. Then we had these finance enthusiasts estimate the dollar value of the stock price at the height of the crisis, and we also asked them to rate the CEO on items that measured benevolence, ability, and integrity, these three components of trust. So here, I'm kind of looking at the full results of our study in analyses that used our experimental condition as an instrumental variable in regressions to explore the link between acknowledgments of human costs and these possible mediators. We found that acknowledgement of human costs from the CEO's side increased perceived CEO benevolence in the eyes of these participants acting as financial analysts. It also had a slight effect on perceived CEO ability, um, interestingly enough. But ultimately what we found is that there was only a significant path through perceived CEO benevolence to then the dollar estimates of the stock price during the crisis. And we also saw similar effects on another measure where we just asked the analysts to say how resilient they thought this company would be compared to other similar companies during times of crisis. So to put everything together into what we, we think is happening based on the explorations from these studies, is that CEO acknowledgement of the human costs of crisis, how a crisis has these impacts on human health and well-being, can increase their perceived benevolence, which then positively influences analysts' evaluations of their company value, and thus could translate into better performance on the stock market um, in times of crisis. So to sum up these kind of discoveries from this line of research, we find that CEOs in earnings conference calls with financial analysts focus primarily on the economic costs that a crisis might have. But there's a link between the acknowledgement of these human costs and company financial value during an economic crisis, which might occur because acknowledgement of human costs increases perceived CEO benevolence, which fosters these more positive analyst evaluations. So taking a step back to the broader insights from this research, we think that it's uh, interesting to continue to study and challenge this kind of dichotomy between the human and economic sides of business. Because we found here that acknowledgement of human costs could actually have kind of tangible financial value. And we think this can expand our notions of what constitutes effective leadership and crisis management, given that a lot of that literature has focused on the need to offset economic costs and threat to business operations in order to resume normality. And on a broader level, we hope that this uh, line of research contributes to societal discussions for the need for business to focus more on people, even or perhaps especially during challenging economic times. <laughs>
So thank you so much for your attention, and now I'm excited to hear your questions and discuss further. Thank you. Did you see any difference between the impact that that would have on a professional investment analyst vis-a-vis vis -a, -vis a an enthusiast, I think, in terms of uh, what you were talking about, and specifically commentary around the reaction that you're seeing for an organization like Unilever, which very clearly is displaying um, much more about the human capital, but yet is being quietly criticized from a professional investment with hedge funds and so on, saying actually this is not actually delivering the economic outcome that they expected. So did you see any difference in terms of your research? Yeah, so in our, our research, we tried to find kind of the best proxy for analysts that we could. So uh, we weren't able to find um, an audience of the kind of professional in the game um, analysts. So our, our best kind of proxy that we uh, could find more people who were pursuing a career in finance and who we assumed would probably think as, as in a way that was a, in a population that was accessible to us, hopefully as similarly as possible to the group of professional analysts. But um, I, I think what your question um, makes me think of is the fact that um, we didn't see in these calls that people were neglecting economic costs, for instance. So they still were taking the time to talk through the serious economic issues that their company would face. So it really was kind of an, an add-on to economic issues, but I get the sense that if CEOs were only talking about the human costs of the crisis and weren't able to address the economic issues successfully, then that would be a situation where perhaps that would backfire, maybe especially among those who are concerned about kind of delivering results. So in the sample that we had and the way that we set up the experiment, it kind of parallel what we saw in the calls that CEOs were talking about economic costs, I think we don't have the opportunity to look at whether this backfires if you're just talking about human costs. But I think given some of the literature that shows that if you talk about, for instance, corporate social responsibility or other things, sometimes it can be perceived as window dressing to kind of distract from more pressing issues. And I imagine we might see some similar backfire effects if the CEOs are deflecting questions about economic costs or don't talk about them at all. Thank you. Um, fascinating research and I think incredibly important research. Um, so I guess my question is, you know, the, the, the outcome variable is, is really interesting in terms of, you know, the pure kind of stock market effect. Um, the independent variable, um, it was fascinating that you went and looked at actually which CEOs talk about the human cost. But of course, what a lot of companies faced in 2020 was, was a, a, a cost challenge. They needed to cut costs because their income was, stream was challenged, so what would they do? And some companies decided, we're gonna save jobs. Your job is safe, and they made that announcement, and other companies cut jobs. So I guess, a couple of questions here. One is, did you see any correlation in the analysis you did as to the CEOs who, who kind of talked about the human aspect of this and companies where they were saving jobs. That's kind of the first question. And the second question is, could saving jobs be viewed as an alternative independent variable, which might lead to a similar kind of outcome? Yeah, I think that's a great question. Um, and, you know, in our, in our research, we ended up focusing on the CEO's kind of words and the way that it might affect financial analysts' impressions. But I think what your question um, makes me think about a lot is what might have CEOs done to, like, to act differently in the crisis, which is something that we didn't look at in the research. So for instance, did they adopt different policies? Um, we tried to get at this in some explorations where we looked at whether companies that would be more affected by social distance measures um, showed more, a str more strongly positive effect of the acknowledgement of human costs, thinking that perhaps that would be an indication that those CEOs who talked about human costs were faster to adopt policies that benefited employees in times where they had to shift to remote work. Uh, we didn't see any evidence for that, but I, I think that's just one proxy and there's probably other avenues. And I, I think what's really interesting is some research showing that based on ideological differences, some CEOs chose not to 
engage in downsizing as like kind of a quick fix for problems, and they maybe suffered some short-term consequences from that, but over the long term, I think fared relatively well. So I think there could be more that's going on that's really interesting to explore through what a CEO actually chooses to do in a crisis. I have a question with regard to the interpretation of your findings, whether you have, whether this is also how you think about it when you relate that to a framework of, of efficient financial markets. So I wondered whether your interpretation is that the crisis was revealing new information about CEO characteristics, because otherwise I would have expected that these uh, characteristics of competence and benevolence have, would have been priced into the price uh, immediately. Uh, yeah, that somehow um, these attributes aren't necessarily already known in terms of a CEO's level of benevolence. Yeah, that's, I think, a really interesting question. I think it also would be interesting to look at potentially the interaction between those two variables. So if CEOs express benevolence, for instance, through other means prior to the crisis, does it matter if they expressed benevolence in these calls? I think it could, however, still be a more potent signal that they're talking about human costs in these calls at this particular moment, given that the calls have this had a very economic uh, focus. So I think um, perhaps if you think about it as like signaling a CEO's level of benevolence, maybe that kind of reminder stands out more in a way that does kind of have this flavor of new information. Um, does that kind of get at what you yeah, were? Exactly. Yeah. Hi, I work for a large international bank. Based on your research, what advice should I be giving my CEO regarding how they communicate well-being um, with analysts or just communication in general? Yeah, I think, you know, what I would say that I think is very interesting is that perhaps what these data reveal is a bit of a uh, mindset shift that could be needed in terms of, you know, seeing these calls as very pressed for time a lot of executives might think, you know what, I don't really need to address the human costs of the crisis. It's just these kind of throwaway statements that don't really matter, that wouldn't have an effect, or I don't have time to address that given all of the other pressing concerns. So I think maybe challenging that mindset to um, suggest that it's worth it to take a moment to just briefly acknowledge the human costs, the kind of wider context of the crisis and its effect in society, um, and that that's, that's maybe worth uh, taking a pause for in the agenda. Um, it certainly doesn't, doesn't seem like it can hurt, uh, so it might, might be worth um, taking some time as a, as a leader to acknowledge these societal costs. Yeah, I guess my question did speak a little bit to, to what you just said, and that I was interested in the idea of is benevolent leadership that brief moment in an analyst call, and is therefore presumably a kind of expression of confidence more than anything else, or is it indeed indicative of a benevolent leadership style, which presumably would mean that this is a proxy measure for all sorts of leadership behaviors um, that you would need to get to, and is there any way we can distinguish um, between A and B there? Yeah, I think that's a, that's a great um, point. Um, what I would say is I think there's certainly a lot of different ways that CEOs can express benevolence um, human cost acknowledgement is one signal of that, but there's certainly a lot of other ones as well, even like the, the policies that they choose to, to implement in a crisis. So um, I think, yeah, there's, there's other ways that benevolence could be signaled to ultimately have an influence. Um, what I would also say is that um, we tried to, to get at that a little bit with the experimental study by trying to hold other things um, constant and just varying the acknowledgement of human costs as, to look at the, the way that that would shape benevolence. So. Um, I think there could be, other, of course, other attributes that are important that um, signal benevolence that we didn't necessarily measure in our study, like CEO personality or other things um, that could be related as well. Thank you. I, I couldn't help wondering whether their reputation on a platform like Glassdoor, for instance, um, would maybe have changed, which might be indicative of a, a broader leadership behavior that you could track. Yeah, I think that's a great idea for a potential control variable to add into the analysis, so thank you. Thank you. 
Um, so I was struck by the fact that talking about the human cost seemed good, but that so few CEOs and analysts thought to do it. And I wonder if you could address what was going on there. So, you know, you would think that if people knew this was important, they, they would do it, but it seems puzzling that they wouldn't know about it. Yeah, I, I think for me, um, my interpretation of that is that perhaps as this crisis was unfolding, it's very dynamic, there's a lot going on, people are trying to figure out how much their company is going to be affected, and what they want to do in these calls is really answer analysts' questions, like reassure them that the company is on course and that it's going to weather the crisis successfully. And so I think maybe the gut reaction, especially given that so much, uh, so many of the ideas about crisis management focus on like restore confidence in business operations, that the gut instinct might be, we need to address these costs as much as possible. And we did see a good degree of variation in how often CEOs talked about economic costs, some kind of emphasizing them more than less. So I get the sense that that was perhaps a way that CEOs thought they would most effectively be able to restore trust, is by talking about these economic costs um, and focusing on those. So I think maybe in the, having this focus on economic costs, that the human costs just tend to get overlooked as something that's not quite as core to uh, managing a crisis. Um, does that help to answer the question? <laughs> Happy to keep chatting over lunch. <laughs> uh, yeah, but it, it, it still seems, so that, that sort of explanation is that for the CEO and the analyst, it's sort of a slip of the mind not to mention it. Because if you thought, well, you know, if, if the CEO had, had come to this talk and then, you know, COVID, next COVID hits, they would think, ah, one thing I need to do is, is I should remember to talk about people. Um, so it's, it's still sort of surprising that, that this wouldn't be a thing people would know to do if it is effective. So it, it's, it's surprising that it's surprising. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I get the sense that in a crisis, there's just so much time pressure and uncertainty that um, even these things that seem a bit more straightforward um, or could be acknowledged just tend to get kind of lost in the, in the chaos, perhaps. Um, as I think we've stopped on questions, I hope I might be allowed a, a tiny one. I, I'm trying to think what the, the transmission mechanism might be in this interesting finding. You, you, you wouldn't expect it to be benevolence in some direct way. So benevolence, or in, to be more precise, benevolent sounding statements are standing in for something else, aren't they? And I don't know whether you know the work by Edmonds. I think it's in the Journal of Financial Economics. Edmonds is at LBS on um, happiness at work as predicting stock market returns. Do you know that, that work? I don't think I know you, that yeah, particular I, paper. I can give you the reference. So the key idea in my mind is whether benevolent sounding statements are standing in for happy places, and happy places are simply more productive in the way that Edmonds found, and perhaps, I don't know whether the glass door idea allowed you to check that, but of course there's the indeed.com rankings of happy workplaces, and if I were a referee, I might be interested to see what's the correlation between express benevolence across all these companies and their indeed score on happiness. Anyway, figuring out the transmission mechanism, if it's something like that, seems valuable. Yeah, I, I agree, and I certainly think there's a lot of different things that could be going on, um, not just the effect on financial analysts, like one possible pathway, but certainly through um, kind of other things that are happening at the workplace, the, the culture dimension on Glassdoor.com might be interesting to account for, for instance. So thanks for the suggestion. Well done, Lauren. We'll have a round of applause, I think.